Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here on EWTN. We have this great opportunity once again to come together and to hear a story. Uh, tonight we're jo joined by Dr. John Berchalski. Uh, he's a revert to the Catholic faith and author of Two Patients, My Conversion from Abortion to Life-Affirming Medicine. Um, doctor, thank you so much for joining me today. John Mark, it's wonderful to be here. You know, uh, I, I know we've got some, uh, I'm so excited to hear your story and to dig into it today. I know that we've got some, some, some heavy stuff to cover, you know, but I, we were talking beforehand that, you know, the, some of the most amazing joy and light uh, comes when the Lord brings us through darkness, through dark times, through conversion, and so, uh, and brings great fruit out of it. I know that's the case in your life, and so. Yeah, God's mercy um, is for all, yeah. and it's forever, and it's so abundant, we can't even imagine how far he loves us and how, how far he will go to uh, uh, to take care of his sheep. Amen. His kids. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to hear the story and we'll get to more, talk more about your work later. Take us way back to the beginning to the beginning of your spiritual journey. Sure. Um, I grew up in a great, I'm 62 years of age. I'm in the prime of my life. It's the new 35. <laughs> and uh, I grew up in a phenomenal Polish Catholic northern New Jersey family. Not only did we have all those wonderful directness, direct issues that we have in <laughs> Jersey, but the family was four grandparents, all parents, mm -hmm. were all Polish. Um, and we were deeply faithful. <clears throat> Dad uh, left the seminary at St. Mary's in his, in his journey and uh, ended up uh, in uh, northern New Jersey as an organist, as a teacher at a Salesian high school, Don wow. Bosco Prep, and uh, a Salesian parish. And he was an organist, self-taught. Wow. So being at Mass, being in the sacraments. I was an altar boy for about a week before uh, we went from Latin to English back in the day. I was born in 1960, and I have two younger brothers. We were all normal, fun-loving, sports-filled, uh, faithful children. We went to Catholic school, uh, grammar school. But remember, this was the late 60s, early 70s. Right. And all of a sudden, we were understanding that it really wasn't uh, uh, Bach or Beethoven. It was Paul Simon and Bridge Over Troubled Waters hmm. and Stairway to Heaven yeah. and God is Love. And so um, went to Catholic grammar school. I had an aptitude for education. Uh, and uh, so I went into high school, I did very well academically, but we began to hear about um, what does the church really teach and what is she really meaning when it's about uh, uh, distributive justice, social justice. Um, the moral and ethical teachings of the faith. Right. And lo and behold, I went from there, because I played baseball, I went to a Jesuit college in the South. My father thought it, was, uh, it would be a little bit more conservative. Baseball was full year round there okay. in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, I was a biology and a history with a history minor. I loved both. My dad was a civics teacher. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. My mom prayed the rosary, quit smoking for us. She worked at a beer factory, you know, blue collar, mm -hmm. and then a, a school teacher. My dad was a civics, religion, theology. And, you know, he had a big poster over his uh, desk, over his blackboard. Back then it was blackboards. What makes men good Christians makes them good citizens. And I believe uh, that was uh, uh, one of the greats in the 1850s, uh, Daniel Webster. Ah. So dad understood the connection between living your faith. We were Polish. We prayed for the fall of Russia. And uh, we prayed the rosary every day. It was natural. Little Rascals comes after the rosary and before <laughs> breakfast. You know how you know mother used to talk about, you know, put it between the bills. No, we did it in between. And it happened in my lifetime. Wow. Yeah. So here I was in a loving family, mm -hmm. but my parents gave way to Catholic education. 
And this was during the time that there was tumult. My dad taught Latin. That was the foundation of language and culture and Western Civ. Uh, we're not teaching Latin anymore because Harvard says it's probably not needed anymore. My daddy was a, by this point, he was no longer a Democrat. He was no longer a independent. He was a Republican because they were pro-life. So here I am now at the age of uh, 12, I guess, 19, uh, 1973, and I'm shooting baskets, practicing foul shots. He drives up, I'm in grammar school, he drives up from high school and Johnny, he pulls his Volkswagen in and says, uh, it's Black Monday. The United States just legalized abortion. What's abortion? Uh, it's when mothers choose to kill their child in the wombs, in their wombs, through the help of a doctor. Black Monday. Oh, that must mean something to him. I'm practicing my foul shot. We had a little conversation about that at dinner, but like good Polish parents, never real deep. Right. They just loved us. Mm -hmm. And that was common at our dinner table. Dad was talking current events. Yeah. He was also talking faith. And yet, going to high school, college, I did really well in the sciences, so they pushed, oh, you can become a doctor, just like my older cousin who was studying medicine, but he couldn't get in. My dad was beginning to have difficulties at the high school because he was too conservative. He still demanded good grades. He demanded you to work. He demanded you to suffer to get, to have something really good and meaningful come out of it. Yeah. And he believed in the teachings of the church. And I mean the teachings. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, a, a great up, a great upbringing, a great family. Solid. Uh, what a solid. blessing! Yeah, it was a blessing, yeah. but it wasn't. My my life turned yeah. because I became more interested in what my peers said about me than what than where I was. And I can tell you that in high school, just talking to the girls and the girlfriends, mm -hmm. we were an all boys school, mm -hmm. so we had to go to. Uh, IHA Academy in another section of mm -hmm. Jersey for, you know, dates and proms and d dances. Um, but I had a knack for listening. My mother, because dad worked so hard, she would talk to me. And I just grew up listening to women, their story, the living books, I call them. And at that time, they needed the freedom to have sex. They needed the liberation of their, from their fertility. They were all complaining and bitching and moaning about PMS and headaches and bloatedness and weight gain. And, and they shared this. And so as I got from my history into the sciences, well, what happens when you start talking about reproductive health? It becomes reproductive health. It's no longer procreation. Right. It's no longer begotten, not made. It's made not, but you know, all of a sudden the words get twisted because Catholic teaching at this point I was learning is you can dissent from it. Right. And that became a big part of questioning. I go to this wonderful Jesuit college in Mobile. I loved, I mean, it was wonderful. I could play baseball, but there the core ethics class was what? Situational ethics, relativism. You have a conscience, and that conscience, they, don't, they didn't talk about formed. <clears throat> In fact, it was, no, Johnny, you have the gift. You can discern. You had that still small voice in your heart. And all of a sudden, some of the teachings that I learned as a child just became not that, oh, that's just not, that's backwards. Mm -hmm. It's old-fashioned. Yeah. And uh, I had a knack for listening and I had an interest in the human, the wonder of the human body. I had models of eyes and hearts alongside tanks and planes growing up as a child. Yeah. But boy, oh boy, I was in love with the wonder of the human body, especially the feminine body. The fact that I could build a model from Ravel that was the invisible woman, and I could open up her abdomen, take out her intestines, and I can replace a pregnant uterus, and she had a pregnant belly, that model still has that today. Wow. 
And I think it left a subconscious. My favorite cousin wanted to go into medicine. So rather than go the toe the line of Polish, hard, you know, good working, smoking, gregarious, <laughs> no, I went into college. And so of my 61st cousins, a few of us, the minority, went to college. Yeah. So I went to college and then I went to medical school. While in medical school, um, fertility is a problem. There's too many people in the world. We must do something about it. Health has a very broad context. It has more than just prevent disease and heal pain. It's how you feel. Are you sad? And oh, by the way, children are sexually transmitted diseases. Hmm. So it was a slow slide away. And of course, uh, I had a knack for OBGYN. And that's when I wanted to be the best I could. And I ended up going to Eastern Virginia School of Medicine in Norfolk, the home of the first American test tube baby. We were also a contraceptive research and development center. Why? Well, uh, John Mark, it's because I didn't want to push abortion on someone else. Abortion was part of our profession. I wanted to be good at it. I didn't want to dump it. I'm, I'm a hardworking young man. I'm Polish. I want to take responsibility. If someone's being enslaved, I'm going to stop. I'm going to help that because, hey, my, you know, my family was hurt by the Nazis. My family was hurt by the Russians. My family was hurt by the communist system. Oh, by the way, by this point, believe it or not, I had fallen in love with liberation theology. And I was all about Marxism. We're speaking tonight with Dr. John Brachowski, uh, Rebert of the Catholic Faith. Uh, you mentioned earlier your father's faith and his example and his witness, and even him having, you know, expressing very strongly his views on this. As you're drifting off in this direction, what was, what, what did you think about his so his pro life ethic? So it was his opinion, because yeah. remember, by this point, mm -hmm. when you move into practical atheism, right. which is what I'm calling it, which is what, so for all of us out there in in your audience. Yeah. This is a story of hope. It's a story of how the Lord reached me. Of course, this is what you do here at uh, Coming Home Network. And I, 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 here I was, I rebelled. But my father was a wonderful, loving man, but he wasn't always demonstrative, forceful. And I literally where that faith was something public and faith was to be shared and invited, the Catholic faith, it became private, it became to yourself, right. hang it up at the door of your office. You don't bring it in, you don't talk, you don't talk politics and faith or you know death taxes and faith at the, you don't bring it up because it's divisive. But I've always had the gift of gab and I've always had the gift of listening. And my patients would talk to me. So I believe that there was this beginning, the split. Mm -hmm. My mother prayed for my soul. My father did also. She prayed for all of us, all of her kids. And I'm convinced that her consistently, her consistent ability to Pray and never give up on us. Yeah. Um, enabled that crack to continue to be within us always. Well, Dad, you're not with me right now, Dad. You're not a doctor. You don't understand. You're an older man. You don't get where we are today. And so, therefore, I need to leave the home and I need to listen to my friends male friends who were talking about sexual activity from the sexual revolution, my female friends saying that fertility was a burden, the chains of their fertility, it's Marxist. <laughs> and then um, when the peers are talking that way and the pastors and priests are talking that way, there are many ways to God, John. Mm -hmm. We're not that special. Mm -hmm. In fact, so it was the faith that was being watered down, mm -hmm. not just watered down. They, was being relativized. Right. And then on top of it, I stopped reading about saints. 
when our shepherds, they, they thought they were helping us acclimate to the new ways of the world, the new language, we were losing who we were. I was losing who I was. I can look back on that now. But the fracture was there because I loved my family. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, telling my... <laughs> so here I am learning about... Well, I'll just say it. Mm -hmm. I had to tell my parents after a time, you know, mom and dad, I really believe that uh, chemicals and plastics are the wave of the future. We can, it, we can improve on the human condition. Yeah. And we can become freer by having more freedom in the sexual area, including abortion. And I plan to do that. And yet, the pain that I saw in my mother's eyes mm -hmm. and my dad's turning away. But I chose my friends. I was a man, ple a woman pleaser, mm -hmm. as a God pleaser who's the God of the family. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I was in that, I was, I've always tried to walk that fine line between, or that's what the church told me. You can't be in the city of God all the time, John. You got to be in the city of man and you have to kind of wait. But it wasn't Augustine's way. Mm -hmm. It was McBride's, it was Curran's way. It was the wave of people who were trying to bring the church into the 22nd century. You know, it strikes me that in a lot of these areas, not just in the in the sexual reproductive area that we're focusing on specifically, but a lot of the other areas you mentioned, <laughs> that we, it's like one of our perennial problems as humans is that we, <clears throat> we think of this split between sort of our intellect, you know, the, the data that we're thinking through and the state of our heart. And when we don't recognize that pride has crept in, we can look at the same data and take it. Yes. Oh. So we now have different interpretations of scripture historically. And this is key to my own reversion. Um, we have different interpretations of scripture. Because of the politicization of science and the politicization of the church, social justice, gospel of life, left and right, whatever, we now have politicization of science. So when people say follow the science, that usually means a leftist-leaning uh, contraceptive abortion. That's evidence-based. No, it's not. No, it's not. Abortion and contra abortion and, and breast cancer, abortion and preterm labor, abortion and mental illness. Mm -hmm. Trust me, we've got plenty of data. But you just look what you want to look at. Be why? Mm -hmm. Because conscience becomes me and my relationship with Scripture, my relationship with God, my relationship with the church. I determine. I become God. How do I know that firsthand? Well, I lived it. But where I went for my residency, the wonderful, we had two of the greats at OBGYN, doctors and doctor, Howard and Georgiana Jones. They came from Hopkins at 65, came to Norfolk, and they helped us develop the first American test tube baby, right after England did it. Wow. We had Father Richard Mc. Brian, I believe, speak at our thousandth baby that we delivered, a Catholic, talking about how wonderful this was. And so as I talk about, as I talk about this, I lived this, meaning that I was there determining, you know, helping. Now, I'm, I was a resident. I was just participating in, but I was part of the team. Uh, which embryos deserve life and which don't? On the labor and delivery, uh, which mother decided her child was worth being a part of our family, the human family, yeah. or not. I was a part of that in my own world, but I saw myself, looking back, the cognitive dissonance that the Lord allows, because the real still small voice is still in us. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it, folks. I just want people to know, don't give up. Your prayers are so powerful. Divine mercy is so powerful, because right now, we are so confused at times. It's only storytelling mm. that gets into our right brain and makes us buy things, makes us see things. And I think we can, it's part of God's way of telling the story of scripture, yeah. but you have to have somebody outside of yourself to tell us. And when I was in my wonderful evangelical church mm. in going, you know, speeding ahead, but yeah. 
I asked my pastor and there was really no teaching. They were a pro-life church, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but it wasn't consistent with pastors and it wasn't consistent within the denomination. Right. And so I said, uh, I better go back to my Catholic faith because I know that they teach this. I wanted the truth. And so this idea, I, I get it, but when you believe that you can decide mm -hmm. and you can determine and you then just look at your echo chamber. It, your, if you know, when I was in the assembly, man, you know, I would bring out my Strong's, you know, uh, my, you know, my, uh, uh, my, my Strong's uh, uh, commentaries, and I would look at. But within the context of that church, yeah. And so, after two thousand years, the Catholic Church provides that magisterial faith and morals right. that it, that enables me the freedom to live my life really seeking truth outside of myself. Right. But in science today, and in families, and in politics, no, science is whatever I decide to make it. Well, let's step back for a moment, back into the sure, narrative sure, sure. And, and connect it up there. So yeah. you take us from college days and, and, and being residency and, and this whole world, uh, what happens next? No, so I have a knack yeah. for listening to women, uh, but I really grew up with family practice doctors, people who prescribed uh, penicillin as often as they prescribed garlic. And so uh, I have always had a foot, and also the Polish background, uh, allopathy and homeopathy, it was just part of our, the way we lived. Uh, clean eating, you know, uh, except for the garlic and the fat and the kielbasa and the kapust and the and the pierogies and the rest. Sounds pretty clean to me. It was pretty clean to me. Yeah, 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 buddy. <laughs> Woo. So anyway, yeah, Grodai's Polish too. I, I, I get you. No, it's French. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get that another time. Yeah, we'll get that. So um, I had a knack, and I, um, I wanted to go to the best schools possible. So I interviewed at all East Coast programs. I knew Harvard and Emory or Harvard wanted me to sign something that, that I knew that I would be doing abortions. They wanted to, because remember, abortionists have been decreasing in number, and I have a reason for that, because it's so brutal, most of us don't want to be a part of the brutal, vicious destructiveness. Go into medicine for healing yeah. and for hope. This intrinsically is not it. However, <clears throat> I wanted to participate. So I interviewed at a bunch of schools. I got in at Eastern Virginia. And not only were they a contraceptive research and development center, so they, we, we learned all the new pills of the day. We were building them at the time. Mm -hmm. IUDs, Norplant, the injectables, that was us. Sterilization procedures, absolutely. Immediate IUDs after the birth of a baby, we did that. We were also an IVF center. We were probably the premier center at that time. Because this was back, so I was in high school from 74 to 78. I was in medical school from 83 to 87, and then residency, OBGYN from 87 to 91. And so this was a time in the church where the pontificate of John Paul, Jerome Lejeune was talking about the concentration can. He played a big role in my reversion. He argued against my professor. So here I was, I wanted to be the best I could be. My people, my, uh, my peers were saying, no, Johnny, this is the where happiness is. My pastors and priests were saying, well, John, you know, this is still not decided territory. People have a conscience, and really, the vast majority of Catholics are already contracepting, so provide that. Make them the best they can be at that. Okay, I'll do it. I just wanted to... And then, lastly, uh, my profession said, uh, abortion is essential health care and contraception is the norm. And if you don't believe that, you shouldn't be an OBGYN. So the peers, the professionals, the pastors, and the patients, my friends. And so I left, and I dove in head first. I did my first abortion with a doctor holding my hands when I was a third year medical student. Hmm. Because I was open. He asked me what was my background. I said Catholic. I said, but I'm open to this. I want to learn. But it was only a first trimester very early, so it just came out in blood and tissue. And I remember how I had to steel myself. I had to take a deep breath in because I knew that I was doing something that my father thought was a Black Monday. But I did it anyway. In this process, 
you know, a friend of mine took me to Mexico City the summer between college and medical school. We went to the Basilica. I hear internally, why are you hurting me? No, it was, the, it was the cerveza at lunchtime. It was the beer. It was too hot. I'm packed in here. No, I, I didn't hear that. And so I'm telling you, buddy. So then I go to my residency and I'm doing this. But the little ones are, you know, they're not easy, but there's no bones. By 10, 11, 12 weeks, you've got to count bones, body parts. Because it's abortion on demand, remember, John Mark? Yeah. And lo and behold, I'm now on labor and delivery, murdering, ending the life, preventing the suffering and pain. Because remember, I still think this is positive, and yet I'm doing the obvious. Uh, almost uh, Down syndrome, yeah, that comes out. That we kill. Mm -hmm. uh, trisomies, absolutely. Trisomy 13, 18, 21, no, that comes out. Extra digit, that comes out. Heart block? Oh, no. Uh, heart dis dysfunction? No, we would never put that child or that family through pain. Mercy is about preventing suffering, not compassion walking with, through. And lo and behold, nobody there is different. It's all the same. We're all different faiths. Some of us are, you know, some of us are even, some, it doesn't matter. But it was practical atheism because really at the bottom line, most of the folks there were nominally anything. And so um, we began to do that. And yet, one night I'm driving down, and I see this pregnancy center at night run by the wonderful uh, First Assembly of Witch Duck Road in Virginia Beach. I go in. I love it. They're holding hands. Dear Lord, please bless all the folks coming in here. We can help provide them a resource. Oh, my God. They're talking. I can do that, too. I never saw. I didn't at that moment because my heart was already getting hardened. My intellect was already getting cloudy. My will was becoming almost zero because the more you do this, the easier it gets, brother. Mm -hmm. But it really doesn't because the hardness of heart stays. Yeah. And then that's when the fracture became even worse. Here I am at night praying and working with pregnancy center people and during the daytime doing my normal OBGYN work. That's when in two rooms, I come face to face with myself. In one room, the mom wants to keep the baby 23 weeks. Baby's about a pound big. She's desperately in love with her child. We're doing everything we can to save that child's life. Next room, mother comes in, no prenatal care, really doesn't want the kid. She's in labor. She's the same age, one pound, 23 weeks. I don't take a good history because she doesn't want the baby. I don't want the baby, the fetus. I break water and pit the baby out. Give her medicine to just spit it out. It comes out into my bucket and I pick it up it and it weighs a little bit too much I'm pretty I love listening I love doing a good physical I love being a doc I love doing my work well I'm Polish I take pride my father knew about the human condition my mother did too pick it up it's a little too heavy I throw it on the scale 505 grams in the state of Virginia, I have to hit the button to call in the neonatal intensivists to save this baby's life. One room, other room, baby thrown on the scale. I hit the button because I believe in following the law, even though I was tempted to just suffocate the kid, which is what we do in this. Today, they're voting on the Born Alive Act. So please, this is real. Anyway. She walks in and says, hey, Dr. Burchowski, stop giving me tumors. You're better than this. And she starts resuscitating the child. She says, listen, you talk to me tomorrow. Can you meet me at, for breakfast, for coffee? Sure. Dr. Deborah Plum, a witness. Every story needs someone to stand up and speak the love of Jesus Christ. She cared for these special little babies in the neonatal intensive care unit. Yes, three, 300 grams, eight ounces, 10 ounces, a pound, all illnesses. That's who she cared for. Those, those were her patients. At coffee, she said, Johnny, you're better than this. They line up in lines in your clinic because you're good at PMS. You're good at endometriosis. You're good at all these things in, in, in GYN, OBGYN. And yet when it comes to this, I saw what you were doing. 
You didn't do a history. You didn't do a physical. You didn't even monitor the kid. And then you ask me to resuscitate this child? How could I care for this child and you not? Oh, by the way, I just got back from a place where the mother of God's appearing, and you need to go there. I said, uh, I'm kind of going to a church now that really doesn't believe in that I stuff, so, so yeah. I don't know if I really want to do that. John, she's a mother. 1927, 26, John, John's gospel. Whatever. I was so, I was, but I was attracted because she confronted a light in the middle of darkness. Yeah. And a few days later, my mom calls and says, hey, do you want to go to Yugoslavia with us? I said, sure. And while I was there, scales came off my eyes and I had an experience in prayer. And uh, I saw myself as a man of unclean lips, hmm. a man uh, not deserving that grace saves you. Grace, his grace, his love. You don't earn it but you have to cooperate with it. Yeah. And Johnny, if you want to do that, be excellent at what you do, see the underserved daily, follow the teachings of my son's church, mm. and oh, by the way, go show yourself to a priest. Yeah. And that prayer set me off on a, a way that made sense of this walk that I had. Let's take a break there. Sure. Take a, little, take a, take a breath. <laughs> process for a moment. Uh, we'll be back in just a minute. Thank you so much, Doctor. Oh, please. You're so welcome. Um, we'll be right back in just a couple of minutes to hear the rest of uh, Dr. John Berchowski's story. Again, uh, if you are on a journey, whatever your background, as you, as you mentioned in the very beginning, Dr. Berchowski, you know, that we're, we're never too far. We're never, we're never too far from grace, and it's all about grace. And so um, check out chnetwork.org. Uh, we'd love to walk with you on your journey. But again, we'll be back in just a minute to hear the rest of his story. See you then. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of our hour this evening and, and hearing just a, a wonderful, heartbreaking in many ways, difficult you know, story from Dr. John Brachowski, a revert to the Catholic faith. Uh, and Doc, you know, uh, again, and you described it a little bit early on in the story, just on how, it's, a, it's amazing how when we, when we make that little step, when we, when we concede, when we compromise a little bit, how quickly it all goes. And, and you described, you know, just, you know, f again, finding yourself just deep in this world. Yeah. Absolutely. Because once you become the arbiter of your truth, you become God. And then everything just piles up. And it's one train car smashing into another train car. And you end up in a place you never imagined mm. because that first movement away from love and truth, yeah. unconditional love and truth, without mercy, without God's mercy, without mm -hmm. divine mercy. Right. When you have human mercy, it ends up as mercy killing and euthanasia mm -hmm. and eugenics. Trust me, history yeah. has shown us not so very, not so good. Yeah. And uh, well, you know, now we have post-humanism, where in my profession, we're manipulating the human person with brain sensors now. I mean, we are now pushing the envelope of what it means to be human. But of course, when you separate love and life through the sexual revolution, through the contraceptive pill, who brought love and life together? I think it was God, the Father, and the Trinity in the garden, one, two, and three, Genesis. Look what happens when you separate that and you become your own God. And so all of a sudden you end up, and here I am, for instance, you know, I'm post-traumatically stressed. But after touching the heart of Christ and his mother and the love of the family of Christ, we are family. We are now children. So there's, you know, mother, father, brother. We are part of the human family. Well, genetically, we are part of the human family. It's a genetics. In the beginning, was the word, but it was also the code. Mm. And the code was life, and the code is life. The human genetic code, it makes us one of the our fought, the people of the our. This is us. Yeah. And once you start tearing that apart and picking it apart, 
and how it was always unified approach throughout history. Mm -hmm. And then the churches began to fall away, and then the, the dissent with, you know, all of a sudden the church wants to, this is what the church, this is what the good God has given us. This is yeah. what Jesus lived for and died for. This is what he promised the Holy Spirit for. Mm -hmm. This is what the book of Acts is all about, mm -hmm. meaning it's advancement through opposition. You have to stand up and talk about truth or who Jesus Christ is in order to have that relationship. And so I love my evangelical church. Yeah. I love them. They're my brothers and sisters. Yeah. I, I praise and worship, mm -hmm. but I also go to the mass. We're in Corinthians and in the, you know, John, you know, in, in the Gospels, this is my body given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's, what I was living was, this is my body, my choice. Mm -hmm. uh, antithetically, uh, wait a second. I understand why, and I don't throw stones at anybody. Yeah. The professors who taught me abortions, I pray for, their, I pray for them. Yeah. Why? Because they did the best they could. They were teaching me. They weren't political activists. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were, but they really cared about their patients. Mm -hmm. And now I have found a group of other Christian, Catholic, CMDA, CMA, you know, all these great organizations of men and women of goodwill who want to care for two patients. That was the name of my yeah. book. And so I realized that it's a slippery slope, John Mark. Yeah. And you end up in places that you don't want to, you don't want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Some people make a big deal out of the slippery slope fallacy, but you know what? Sometimes slopes are slippery. <laughs> They're really slippery, right? Like yes. the, we, the, you always think that there's 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 lines I won't cross. There's places I won't go because I'm a good person. But again, once we, we we in our pride we step away from God, you know the numbers of Catholics who have abortions is kind of the norm. Yeah, and uh, Catholics who dissent on church teaching is pretty much the norm, and that's why this program, I was so grateful to be asked. Because I have found the peace and the joy and the honesty and the challenge, the questions. Because we know, remember, we don't circumvent questions. Right. We actually want to, we, we want conversation. Yeah. We don't demonize and we don't shut them down. In fact, when the church makes pronouncements, it listens to everybody. Mm -hmm. In fact, my professors were part of the working group at the Vatican mm -hmm. because they were the leading experts on IVF. They were, that was when they put out Donum Vitae and they put out the other uh, uh, Dignitas Personae. Mm. Why? Because the church wants to embrace, but it has 2,000 years of the wisdom of many, many men and women thinking, praying, discerning yeah. this newness. Yeah. And it's not faith, once again. Science is telling me. Mm. You know, once again, that's one thing on one, but I have to talk to medical students. Mm. It's not a faith discussion. And so you come off the hill, what do you do? You come off the hill and there's this little man sitting outside. Hi, do you speak English? Yes. Father, so Holy Spirit. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been maybe 17 years since my last confession. I dismembered a two pound unborn child last week. And then it just kept out, then it just started flowing out of me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I said that with the full force of the First Assembly Evangelical Church, as well as all my brothers and sisters in that cloud of witnesses that have gone before me, and all the men and women right now in your audience who have prayed for people like me. John Mark, your audience prays for people like me. I, my story, you come off the hill, you get to confession, and then you get a chance to go back to receive. Oh Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under the roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. At that moment, I knew how important Project Rachel was. At that moment, I knew how important the pro-life work was. It's not about saving babies. It is part of it. It's about giving women a heck of a lot better than what we're getting. Mm. Why pump carcinogens into your body to treat every illness? Why not hate the disease, love the patient? Mm. By the way, so that's why I come off the mountain totally different. I come back and I talk to my professor and say, Dr. Georgiana, that, remember, she's the foundress of cortisol. She's the foundress of Cushing's disease. She's the, she's the, the world's expert on in vitro fertility. 
I, I, can't, um, I can't remove eggs and make embryos. They're part of my family, and we shouldn't treat them like this. Oh, God, John, you found Jesus. That's what she said. Yeah. I said, yeah, I did. <laughs> she goes, uh, listen, you're really a good re- resident. Um, what about, oh, that means you can't do abortions either. No, I can't. And I can't provide contraception because there's a better way. Just what you talk about when you talk about a woman's body and the stretching of her cervical mucus, that's what we're teaching. I can see it now. The church has, oh God, but it's not the church anymore. It's good scientists all over the world are studying this and it's becoming scientifically valid. Oh, John, no, just keep it to yourself. Because remember faith, even though this woman was a wonderful Episcopalian, there in Norfolk, you know, the Church of Virginia. It was private. It was personal. Your relationship. Don't spread it. And you don't mix it with science. And so, but I, you know, come out. There's a young man from the Mormon church outside. Hey, Bruchowski, it looks like you did it. Are you on our... What? Mormon did this. Instantly, I was in a little community of love. They knew that I could do this. And lo and behold, I went back to church, found the Catholic community in Norfolk, went to an all-black America, uh, St. Mary's Catholic Church, where several of my Assembly of God folks came with me. We we're praising and worshiping, and then when it came to consecration, could hear a pin drop. Lines for the sacraments, but a very lively service. Yeah. And there I am realizing. So then I, fi- I start becoming pro-life. I start debating people because once you become pro-life, people start pulling you in. Mm-hmm. Pregnancy center work was a part of my life. And so I end up getting a job in Silver Spring, Maryland, in a wonderful pro-life practice. But remember, pro-life means different things to different people. Words no longer have a definition mm-hmm. because we create our own meaning. And uh, we had a wonderful... Uh, uh, a non-Catholic brother and sister, a uh, wonderful uh, uh, Protestant. Uh, she still believed in sterilization. She still, you know, I loved her. I mean, she's a great lady, taught me a lot. Contraception was still a given. Sterilization in occasions. Well, be excellent, follow the teachings of my son's church, and oh, by the way, see the underserved. So that's when my wife and I, my wife pushes me, of course, because she has been a part of this story the whole time. We open up Tepeyac OBGYN, or Tepeyac Family Center, as we called it, in 1994, in our basement. It was a for-profit practice. We Mm -hmm. started in our basement. Two great Catholic doctors offered me space in their office. We ran it for about four months, and then the patients came from out people who were on fire with the Holy Spirit came from the Catholic Church and from our non-Catholic brothers and sisters, because I have connections, you know, you're building the body, especially on this pro-life issue. And all of a sudden, because we pray with patients and we cooperate with pregnancy centers and we work with all pregnancy centers, including those who may be only Catholic or anti-Catholic or both or not, you know, or it didn't matter. Send them to us. Mother Teresa was a big deal. She's the conclusion of my book. Johnny, come to, please come to, you know, come to Calcutta. Oh, mother, I work at a not-for-profit. We actually went not-for-profit halfway through our 30 years of, of work. Why? Because we had to see the littlest, the least. We had to see. It's not about social justice. It's about living the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not about politics. It's not right or left. It's not either the gospel of life or the social justice. It's both and. Mm. And you do it because of the love of Jesus Christ that loved you first. So we developed over time, health is relational, sacrificially relational. That's what health is. Mm. You and your doctor and patient, patient and family, us and our maker, our creator, our Abba, our daddy. And yet we have people coming to us who are Muslim, who are Jewish, who are atheist, who are pro-choice, pro-abortion. Why? We practice good medicine, but it's relational. I fully, that's, that gets a standing ovation, whether at Harvard, at Chicago, USC, or Creighton, it doesn't matter. Yeah. 
Health is relational. And then it's health, medicine becomes an act of mercy. Because I was touched by the font of mercy, Divine Mercy Care is the organization, is our umbrella organization. It's what I'm president of now. Mm -hmm. I've been sick, so I can't work in the office, but I'm still, I actively help care for patients by raising funds and awareness. It's an almsgiving program. Mm -hmm. So what the history of the church has been, where did hospitals come from? No, nah, the Romans, no, no, no. That was only for soldiers in the Roman army. It was Catholic institutions, monasteries, nunneries, who then said, we need to care for our, the folks coming on pilgrimages. And they opened up their doors. Right. And all of a sudden, I'm now getting interest by so many folks because of our alms. We're a not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. Once you kind of pull out that motive, yeah. and you really have to suffer with all the craziness of the medicine, of the business, of not doing the standard of, you know, the what the world thinks is great reproductive health. We talk about it, we give them options, but people are tired of this after 50 and 60 and 70 years of the littered bodies that go along the line of the sexual revolution. And I, we, because we are near, you know, the heart of darkness, Washington, DC, <laughs> we get people from both sides of the aisle coming. Right. Even though they disagree with us on principles, our medicine is pretty sharp. Yeah. And I just want folks to know that when you have health is based on relationships, sacrificial relationships, mm -hmm. as, and you can, talk, you can move that anthropologically or faithfully, yeah. medicine becomes an act of mercy, you can move that in many ways. You can come back to the word. You can actually help people understand the word divine, divine mercy, mm -hmm. and then care. What we do in medicine, and then you hate the disease but love the patient, that's principle three. And fourth is, oh, by the way, by collaborating in your community, mm -hmm. you can build what some people called the, the net or the woven fabric, but it's more than that. It's the body of Christ. It's your community. Mm -hmm. It's where the spirit works. What's, what happens in Columbus, thank God, is different than what happens in Northern Virginia. Mm. It's a whole different place. And so I know that the Holy Spirit works in these small groups. Yeah. And, when, and when the church talks about, you know, and so I, I, I said goodbye to my friends in my evangelical church, and I said, I'm coming home back to the Catholic church, but I'm going to bring with me all that I learned along this journey. And uh, you've, this book has opened that up. Yeah. And it's very important that docs go back to looking at patients again, two patients, especially if you're an OBGYN. Mm -hmm. And there's some good talk and conversation and there's health and happiness. You know, there was a study done by Wh Wharton mm -hmm. University. Because remember, I told you I got into this because I wanted to make women healthy and happy and whole. Uh the world's way of approaching that doesn't make it happen. Right. Wharton Business School, two great authors there in, I think, 2000, maybe the, 2009, maybe. Women's happiness has declined since 1970. Hmm. Once again, I think the pill was an incredible, was probably the largest revolution in my lifetime. I was born in 1960, the, the birth of the pill. Yeah. And so this idea that you can approach the human person integrated, holistic, mm -hmm. you know, NAPRO technology is, you know, it's just, is, is, is a great way to approach it. Yeah. And so cooperating with a woman's language of her body, mm -hmm. fertility awareness-based methods, seeing that fertility is a healthy, you treat the disease always, never, you don't get rid of people with diseases to get rid of diseases. Right. And then we have a perinatal hospice now because it's we use the womb as a place of care and comfort for as long as that child is with you. And so now with Roe falling and then Dobbs, it's a new springtime, I believe, even though uh, we're still in that harsh winter. Yeah. Wow. Um, I mean, we could, we could talk for a couple hours. There's so many topics I want to go into here. I do want you to talk a little bit more Please. about the book. Um well, yeah, start there. We've well, got yeah. about five minutes. Tell, That's tell fine. No. Book. So yeah. two patients. Yeah. So 
two patients is the uh, is my conversion story from where I was, and so it's a very hopeful book, and it's for people who parents who have children in medicine or children who have wandered away from the faith, or have wandered away from scripture. Um, it's a way. It's hopeful to actually build communion in the different creeds and the different denominations. Uh, it's a way to to bring reason and love and understanding and compassion, but also our differences, to come to a place of really helping each other come to love the Lord and, pro and profess His glory. So Two Patients was written, uh, just came out in uh, October, November of this past year uh, uh, with Ignatius Press. Wonderful. And so that's, you know, uh, you, can, you can go to there or you can, I, I, uh, you can go to any place that books are sold. But Ignatius Press has the book, and uh, I believe maybe uh, uh, EWTN may also have it. Um, the other piece is that uh, Tepiak OBGYN is a OBGYN practice in Northern Virginia that performs, does this on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It's a great place for um, people to learn and share. We're one of many that have come up since we started. You know, we were back in the early 90s. Well, because of the great work of so many doctors and medical practices, fertility awareness centers, yeah. fertility care centers, and the Catholic churches <clears throat> um, continue focus on this issue of the deeper issues of what women go through, moms go through, <clears throat> families go through. Um, it's a good place for that. Divine Mercy Care is the umbrella organization that helps <clears throat> make the almsgiving method work mm -hmm. at Tepiac and we can share that method with others, but also it educates and exhorts and encourages many of us who are burned out, yeah. young students especially. That's really where the focus has been. There's this groundswell of young Christians and Catholics, non-Catholics and Catholics, coming together wanting more than just what technology and the, and the human can do. And there's a way that human flourishing in the Catholic tradition for 2,000 years really helps the science. Yeah. You can do excellent science because there's no difference. In a world that says, oh yes, we're split everywhere. Mm -hmm. There is no difference between faith and reason. Right, Catholicism is about reality. It's about reality. Yeah. And I can tell you that as I've gone through my own post-traumatic stress of mm. doing what I've done in my life, mm -hmm. life in the spirit seminar, yeah. priests prayed over me and the black oil poured out of me. The education, the reading of scholars all across this country, great men and women who have speak up based on 2,000 years of thought. Yeah. And then the 2,000 years or so before that, or 4,000 years of Hebraic thought. Mm. It's one family, yeah. genetically, embryologically, biochemically, as well as faithfully. Yeah. It's Catholic with a small C. It's universal. It's, it's reality. And I think people will find that if they uh, expose themselves to it in, in a honest way, mm -hmm. despite the pain, despite the challenges, because it's not an echo chamber. I really recommend people check out the book again. Two two patients: my uh, my conversion from abortion to life affirming medicine. Tepeyak, obgyn dot com. Um, we've got about a minute thirty left, and <clears throat> you've shared so much wonderful testimony with us. If there is a person out there who has been on one side of or, or the other on this issue, whether post abortive or someone who's been involved in in, in the medical practice, who's yes. been involved in those things, give them a word of Mercy and encouragement, if you would. So, um, so you are not alone, mm. number one. Um, DivineMercyCare.org mm. is where I'm at right now. Contact us because it's, we want it to be a one-on-one -on -one place to help you access the resources that are available. Because of the pro-life unity and because of, because of the pro-life unity, when it happens, based on the healing presence of Jesus Christ, which is the only answer today. Amen. Politics, it's it, economics, it looks like it's all, no. Our Lord has been through this before us, now and forever. He's the same, and His love extends to you
deeply because he is unfazed by this and he wants to welcome you home and uh, reach out. There's, there's many of us who would share our stories and our testimonies and our, just our realities with you. And uh, I am just grateful for this program and uh, please uh, don't give up. Um, uh, don't ever give up as a, a famous basketball coach would say <laughs> and reach out. Amen. Dr. Borkowski, thank you so much oh for thank your you, testimony and for your courage. And we thank, we thank God, right? That again, wherever the darkness that we've come out of, uh, his mercy, his grace. Um, and you know, you brought up something earlier that I wanted to reiterate there that the audience, uh, as they hear testimony, know that we're praying for them yes. and they are praying for us. Intercessory for people. It, it's, it's such a big thing, the intercessory the prayer. Rises. So keep praying and we'll be back again next week here in the Journey Home program to hear another story. God bless you. We'll see you then.